So good evening, uh, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'll start off with a couple of announcements and then open for questions. And then we'll I'll share my screen and we'll go over, we'll do a little review of this of the standards, national standards and how they're organized. <clears throat> and then we'll uh, actually do more in depth of the next two standards. This is our second to the last uh, live Zoom session, and they're all recorded, obviously. Uh, <clears throat> and I just wanted to thank the people who have uh, in the module one, and I'm sticking with looking at module one and module two uh, and not going on further. Uh, and everyone should take their time and do a really good job in the modules. Because remember the way you actually earn credit is that you respond thoroughly to all the questions in the prompt uh, and also read comments by other colleagues and then respond to them as well. So the responses that I've read um, are uh, really well organized and very thoughtful. Uh, we have 117 applications. We only have 70 people who are on, who are registered uh, in the Canvas course. Uh, usually Fridays and Wednesdays, I check uh, the modules. And then when people haven't responded uh, to any <clears throat> uh, of the modules or prompts and they still haven't been activate, active in the course, uh, I'll send a personal email and ask if you have further questions or if you have concerns or issues or, you know, you this is your first time uh, using the USBE Canvas platform. So I just want to make sure that you know I focus on whatever's being said in the modules, but I'm only focusing on module one and two. And the purpose is that I would like to see all 70 people involved. And I don't want to keep going back and forth, back and forth um, to pick up the post discussion posts <clears throat> that people are submitting um, much later than the original time. Uh, also, if you have uh, questions or if you have concerns or there's something that's come up in your family and <clears throat> or you know other personal issues, uh, all you have to do is email me in the Canvas platform and let me know so that I uh, find out that <clears throat> so that you tell me that you're still interested in interpreter uh, level one certificate. Uh, the RFP, which is uh, a contract that goes out and is made public so that any company who is skillful in providing an advanced course, uh, and there's no cost to you at all, uh, will be available. Mm -hmm. The way in which uh, you move toward the advanced course is that you successfully complete uh, level one. Uh, every module, uh, well-written, thoughtful, based on the rubric, uh, as well as um, your attendance log on the Zoom uh, meetings. Most Many of you have <clears throat> been in the Zoom meetings in person, which I would really recommend, and I'll send an email out to remind everyone that uh, next week is our last um, live Zoom uh, meeting. Because... When we hear from other people uh, and people that are committed to interpreting and they talk about their experiences, then we can actually learn more. Uh, and I learn more and I can go back to the my colleagues at USBE and bring up issues that have arisen for interpreters. Uh, one uh, specifically, and I emailed uh, my friend um, and colleague at USBE over coordinator for special education about the issue that came up last week <clears throat> at the end of an IEP meeting, uh, how is it that uh, students are eligible for extended learning, whether it's summer school or uh, extended day or whatever it is, and what's the criteria? Uh, and she has been out um, and not available, but I will check again. Uh, and then next week, uh, I'll come back with some responses to our questions that came up 
uh, last week. Uh, the other thing is um, there are issues that have arisen related to uh, not only HB 302 and HB 230, which is on the Title III website. Um, I'll put an announcement in and then add something at the end so that you can review all the resources on the Title III USBE webpage. It has uh, information about uh, the rights of parents, the rights of families uh, to a quality education for their children, um, memos from the Department of Justice and the Department of Education in the Office of Civil Rights, uh, and how funding uh, is used and the requirements for uh, applying for supplemental funding uh, for Title III, which is a federal program. <clears throat> so those things uh, will be available for you. Uh, I'm going to stop now and just wait a few minutes for any questions before I share my screen. Okay, so remember when I share my screen, you can just uh, talk. I can actually see if you if you have your hand up, I can actually see it and see who's talking. Uh, <clears throat> when you have a question or you want to share an experience that you've had interpreting, feel free to do that uh, and just say your name and which district or school or organization that you're working with. Uh, and so I'll need you when I share the screen to tell me if you can actually uh, see it. So can you see the screen? We can yes. see it. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> again, for purposes, remember this is really implementing uh, the state law, HB 302, providing technical assistance um, and When you think about the 42 school districts and the children that are in those districts and 137 charter schools with all the diverse languages that we have, which is in Utah about over 150, the uh, certification is a way to really provide technical assistance for implementation of the law. And so, you know, just always reminding ourselves that that is the purpose of interpretation uh, is the implementation and technical assistance for a language access policy that every local education agency, whether it's a district or a charter, must have approved by the board, uh, which is based on the HB 302. And just an overview and then a brief review <clears throat> of what we covered last week. Uh, we won't go into detail, but it's just a review. Uh, <clears throat> that the first standard is about accuracy and fidelity. And then there's always an ethical principle uh, that represents the commitment for practicing interpreters to better understand their role uh, as a professional. And underneath, so there are 46 objectives and there are eight standards of practice. Uh, and then the eight ethical principles. Um, one of the reasons this is organized this way is because these are national and international standards. And so to become aware of these is a way in which you can uh, better become a professional uh, and identify. And that's why in the modules, uh, the questions are a self-assessment for you to identify which objectives you feel strong in and why. Uh, and maybe examples of why you think that's true. And then being really honest and focusing on one or two objectives, whatever you feel that you wanna work on, um, and not so much as a weakness, but as a way to develop your skills and really focus on becoming more of a professional. Uh, and this is kind of what we consider the way in which you develop um, performance criteria for uh, a well-developed career by setting your own goals and then working toward those goals. So the first standard again is this whole idea of being very accurate and faithful to what's communicated uh, and all the messages without adding anything or 
um, kind of enlarging the meaning. It's really preserving the meaning of the message uh, by accurately uh, and faithfully as possible to the best of your ability to really interpret uh, what is actually being said. And we went over that last week. The second standard is confidentiality, which we also talked about last week. And you can feel free to jump in and ask questions or use examples. We had uh, two or three really excellent examples in our earlier session. Um, and again, you know, the standard of confidentiality means that <clears throat> whatever you're actually hearing in the meeting, whatever you learn, uh, whatever information is either spoken or written, um, that you're really focused on maintaining that confidentiality and that uh, even in passing with colleagues, you wouldn't, you wouldn't really talk about anything that's being said in those meetings. Um, so that's, you know, part of the reason USBE has a chief privacy officer, um, the state legislature, they have a chief uh, privacy officer. <clears throat> and the whole goal, again, is to create an environment in which uh, clear and honest communication can happen. And if there's not confidentiality, then, um, you know, obviously um, either the families or the educational institution uh, do not feel comfortable in being totally honest. And that's one of the key components uh, in really working to benefit uh, the students that we work with and uh, the families that want the best for their child. So this, the standard of, of privacy and confidentiality is really, really uh, critical. Uh, one example that came up was, um, <clears throat> it was actually... Uh, an issue where the lawyer was there uh, and it was a family and there were some uh, unjust things going on in their apartment. Um, and the lawyer was very clear with the interpreter about saying how important it was to interpret exactly what he was saying. And so, you know, that's a perfect example, whether it's uh, about legal issues um, or uh, behavioral issues or consequences related to anything with, uh, you know, a resource officer. <clears throat> Karina. Yes, um, that um, standard number two um, really rings my ears a lot because we face a lot of information with with time um, and there might be cases where there is there is a risk factor and we have to um, break confidentiality and pursue the um, pursue the the agencies if we ever feel like there is um, a need to um, contact um, federal agencies, we we have to. Um, I just think about an example where we had um, an IEP and some information was shared. And then at the end, through um, conversation with both parents, um, the environment was really good for communication. And then one of the parents share information that at the end we felt we had to pursue something. And I was, I'm really glad it happened because it turned out to be something bigger than we expected. Um, I, I think about that a lot. Yeah, Karina, thank you for uh, adding that. W one of the examples is the obligation for any, uh, to report any kind of suspected abuse or anything like that. And so, you know, the question of how it is you work under those conditions is really important because of the responsibility that the interpreter and the educational institution has to protect uh, the child from any unforeseen circumstances that end up getting disclosed at meetings. So thank you so much for bringing that up. Uh, standard three is about, <clears throat> which for me is always, uh, you know, very challenging. Uh, it's to be, to maintain being, you know, impartial and showing no preference for one party or another. Uh, 
this is always challenging and it goes back to our conversation that we had last week about you know really understanding the family situation and wanting to be an advocate for them and then feeling whether <clears throat> it's a feeling that you have or you're identifying from them any kind of nonverbals um, where they're confused. Uh, and so really putting the responsibility of clarity on the administrator or the teacher or whoever is uh, leading the meeting uh, so that the appearance of being partial either to the educational institution uh, or the family uh, is not uh, perceived as a, you know, a barrier for um, clear communication. So this principle is really, really important uh, and it ends up being a challenge because, you know, uh, if you have a close relationship with the family, the question ends up being, and this, uh, this was shared with us um, by someone uh, today, there was a really close relationship with family and then there was an issue that came up and the family wanted the opinion, like, what should we do uh, based on the opinion of the interpreter who was a good friend of the family? And the interpreter rightly said, you know, I am an interpreter. My role is to interpret and not to uh, give opinions or give you advice because the choice that you make is the choice for you to make. And if you need more clarification and help with that, then the administrator can make that clear, the options. Fresia, is it fresher or fresia? I keep on saying the wrong thing. You're fine, fresher or fresia, either one is fine. Fresia. So I this was a really, this one really hit home to me as I went over the assignment and whatnot, because I find that I am, it was good information for me to know that it's on the responsibility of the administer to, administrator to explain how things work, because I find myself often when the parents don't understand, I ask, can I just explain to them? And they're like, yes, please go ahead. And that's happened a couple of times. And so when I looked at this and I studied this assignment and worked through it, I realized that's not the right way. So it was a good opportunity for me to learn the correct way to do it, because I do tend to, out of wanting to advocate for the people that I'm interpreting for, and because I can see that they're confused and they indicate so, and then I express that, the administrators up to this point have been more than okay to let me just explain and I'm, and I'm realizing now that that's not the correct way. Yeah, uh, I would say, uh, Karina, you can speak after this, but what I would say is that <clears throat> one of the things that ends up happening is the, the administrator or whoever's running the meeting ends up not being as well educated as the interpreter. So uh, based on the law, I mean, there are many, I've just had a couple of experiences this week um, uh, from districts and other people uh, who keep on insisting that the newcomer program should be segregated, that they should be, uh, you know, uh, all put together. Well, in the first place, that's against like federal law and state law. Um, and then the other thing is uh, whose responsibility is that to explain to the families the situations in the system of the schooling? It's the administrator. It's not the interpreter. The interpreter's role is to interpret what the educator is explaining. And if there's still a lack of clarity, you know, the interpreter can say, can you use some examples to help them better understand? Or, you know, the family still don't understand exactly how this is working. So the responsibility is on the educator. It's not on the interpreter. And that should really, when we go down further and look at some of the other objectives, you'll see that emotionally interpreting uh, is very challenging. And so the question becomes, how do you take care of yourself and in a way that you are clear about your role as a professional so that you don't take on all the responsibility that should be in the educational system? I, I appreciate the word that you used about taking care of ourselves because this week I've been busier than normal. And I found the mental exhaustion <laughs> that comes from it. So I appreciate what you're saying right now with that. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> you know, that happens to me. 
I won't say almost every day, but I guess I will say almost every day. By the time we actually finish working with a district and a group of people who are trying to design programs that work for students, the way they design the program oftentimes is against federal law, as state law, and they have no idea. I mean, they, they just have no idea. And so um, what I do is, you know, I say to them, here's some examples of other districts and other places uh, who've actually done it in a way that it's not against federal law. And here are the resources uh, on title on the web page there. Here are all the resources for the toolkits. And, you know, once you start working and working with these other people across the state and you have a really solid program, then let's meet again and talk. So the whole goal for me is not to make decisions for them. They want me to make a decision about what they should do. Now, if that happens, whose responsibility is it? Are they responsible or am I responsible for trying to solve their problem? So it does, and it is emotionally exhausting, frankly. Um, I used to get more, uh, a little bit more frustrated and more upset, but um, you know, that doesn't really help me working with all of you or working with uh, the students that I work with or you know, my other colleagues. And so taking care of yourself is really important because it is emotionally exhausting. Uh, Corinna. Yes, I was just thinking about an example with um, this one, um, especially when it comes to phone calls that the interpretation interpretations are not at the same time where I will get a phone call from school and can you call this parent and ask this, 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 and that. Um, and there have, there have been times when, for example, today the parent was just asking me about uh, her student, let's say she's in third grade, and then um, she was asking for my opinion if she should um, stay in third grade again after um, explaining a few things. And then I thought about, well, it's not my, um, right. I'm not in right to give an opinion, especially if it's something as delicate as that where school should not give an opinion. And I, and she's asking for my, my opinion, but I work for the school district and we don't want a situation where this parent will be like, well, this person told me this, this and that. Right. So, well, um, talking on the phone also should stay as sharp as it is while we're um, interpreting in person because we don't want any um, information to go on the wrong way. Yeah, thank you. That, I think that's a perfect example, this idea. Uh, and of course, you know, people are interested because they have a closer, generally, they have a closer relationship with the interpreter, right? Because the interpreter speaks their language. And so they're interested in the, in, you know, the, the interpreter's opinion, but the problem is exactly as you said, you know, you cannot, your role is not to give your opinion. Uh, it causes like terrible, terrible problems because then the parents would say, well, you know, uh, so-and-so has this opinion. And so, you know, I'm going to go with that. The other thing is retention in grade levels, uh, all the research ever done with retaining a child in the same grade does not make a lick of difference, does not support the student at all. The question ends up being, you know, why do people think that keeping a student back with the same kind of instruction is going to change the outcome for the student? It's the instruction and the program that needs to change. So that's part of the other issue of getting involved based on opinions when administrators should actually know the research uh, and they should be the experts in relationship to supporting a student instead of holding them back. So there's somebody else's hand, hand is raised. Yeah, that was me. I just had another question kind of going back to the, um, obviously it's not our place to give advice the question that I kind of wanted to pose tonight to the group is once an IEP starts, what I'm finding is that because you speak the same language as those you're interpreting for, there's a lot of small talk and like 
normal conversation that goes on. My question is at what point, like, am I translating all of that? It, what you would consider a sidebar conversation and at what point do you draw the line and what is appropriate? Yeah, I don't know if anybody wants to say anything else, but the biggest issue is sidebar conversations are not the source of a formal interpretation. They're exactly that. They're sidebar conversations. So at that point, I'm. It, it's okay for me to interact with them until that meeting begins. I mean, that's once the, the SPED teacher begins their review that's that's when it's yes official correct yeah yes but you have to make sure that you check with the um person the sped person or whoever's leading the meeting if it's okay with them if, if it's well and i find that it happens even like even amongst teachers that are at the iep that there's this little small talk and trying to keep up with all that and i think okay maybe do i need to establish i don't what what do you suggest would be a good solution for that? Well, the biggest thing is to actually talk to the person who's leading the meeting and say, you know, can we set norms so that there isn't small talk going on and that the real uh, communication is between the person who's speaking to the family at the time when it's uh, the most important to communicate? I mean, you're going to have to set that up with the with the person who's leading the meeting. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so uh, standard four, you know, it's it. This one seems like pretty obvious, <laughs> like you know, respect people um, for all parties involved in the interpreter encounter, which goes back to kind of what you're saying, <clears throat> because sometimes people who are doing the small talk, they don't really know how disruptive it is, right? And so you have to uh, address this with the person who's leading the meeting, and then maybe even set norms about no side conversations, right? And so this ends up being respecting all parties based on the purpose for what the meeting is, right? The purpose of the meeting is not having a confab with colleagues and having side conversations. You know, it's about the benefit of the child and the interaction with the person who's leading the meeting and what's being communicated to the parents to benefit the child, right? So the clearer you are about the purposes of the meeting, the easier it actually is to conduct a meeting in a very professional way. Um, again, you know, under the objectives, there are three of them. And again, you see what it says? The interpreter promotes direct communicate uh, communication among all parties. So direct communication means direct communication. It doesn't mean side conversations. The interpreter engages in behavior that promotes autonomy and personal choice. Okay, so this one is really uh, critical. It goes back to this whole question of, you know, not giving your opinion and allowing the kind of information that helps the family make their own decisions, their own personal choice, right? And so you're actually building, you know, kind of the self-confidence and the autonomy of the family in making the kinds of decisions that they want for their child instead of expecting the administrator or anybody else to give opinions and make decisions for them, right? So, so how do you actually do that? Uh, and the way you do it is you provide the best information and clarify what the families need so the administrator can be very clear about what's being communicated and what choices the family has. Corinna. Yeah, in, in this one, um, for example, I haven't, um, I have more of an opinion, not with IEPs, but especially with, um, let's say, student interventions, where um, we might come across times where, let's say, we're getting together parents and the relationship is not good, and maybe the administrator doesn't know that there's um, there are problems at home. So I think it's very important to communicate expectations 
that um, tell tell the party tell the party members that we're here because we want to achieve something. Yes, and, and um, that we're here to promote communication and we want to solve and whatever we're trying to solve. And for example, I have come across times where there's a, an intervention and maybe a psychologist will roll their eyes and um, things like that because yeah. we're listening to a lot of things, right? Or, or maybe a mom or dad will, is making a face and that doesn't promote communication. That will make the party members want to stop the meeting because they will think it's pointless. So at the beginning, um, communicate expectations, I think it's great because maybe the administrators doesn't know what's going on, but if we do, that might help achieve what we're expecting. Yeah, I think you're making several really good points. One is, um, and you know, I catch myself doing this. Uh, there was someone, I think it was yesterday, and you know, what they were saying about designing their program was clearly against the law. And I was so shocked that, you know, here is an educational professional on a team and they actually thought that this design for the program, you know, was okay. Um, and so I caught myself just, you know, almost shaking my head in frustration. And so your point about setting standards and setting kind of communication goals about the purpose of the meeting uh, really makes a difference in the way in which we respect each other and provide opportunities for uh, authentic choices to build the capacity of the families to make good decisions, uh, to benefit their child based on the purpose of the meeting. So thank you for bringing that up. Do you want to add something else? No, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, so this next standard, standard five, actually uh, reinforces what we've been talking about. And this is about uh, striving to really perform professional duties within the role of an interpreter. Right, refraining from any personal involvement. This, you know, this goes back to this idea of um, underneath, which I think is much much clearer than than the top one. It says uh, protection of professional integrity, and this means your professional integrity, right, as an interpreter. So, and because of that, it reduces exposure to any kind of liability of misunderstanding and to your own emotional well-being and your physical safety. You know, so sometimes uh, people lose their temper. Uh, and as a consequence, you know, there are unforeseen circumstances that happen. But because you're clear about your role to enable communication between the parties uh, who speak on their interest and they make their own decisions. And so that... So that's the other thing. It's, you know, how do we actually explain a system of education that it ends up being very complicated and foreign to other people? We're not even talking people with another language. I mean, we're just talking in general to people. Um, a system that ends up being confusing with its own vocabulary. Um, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, in the letter from the Department of Justice and the Department of Education uh, that, that I'll make sure that you have a copy of, I have to go back and check the modules and see if you do, uh, it's very clear. And in there, it talks about uh, an educational program that can't be segregative. Now, segregative is kind of a strange word, but what it means is that you can't segregate students by their language proficiency so that they don't have equal access to the core content at their grade level, which is really challenging because oftentimes people think they're doing, um, you know, other, that they're doing children a favor by keeping them in a low level uh, of English, which is not the case. Uh, another example is that when families go to register their children, 
and their first language is Spanish, they're never told that there's a dual language immersion Spanish program that would actually help the student maintain the family language and become literate. And because of that, they would have more opportunity to more quickly learn English. That's what all the research says. So the question ends up being, you know, basically, how is it that we keep, you know, our emotional balance and that our communication benefits the party's interests and helps them make better decisions? So, and this really goes back to this idea of not showing bias or preference, um, that the interpreter is not advocating for one party or another, right? You're simply communicating in the responsibility for explaining the educational system and the choices are the administrator. Again, it says, you know, um, the interpreter does not enter the discussion, give advice, express personal opinions, um, all of these things we've talked about so that it's really clear that you don't, uh, the interpreter doesn't uh, speak on the behalf of anybody else, doesn't uh, filter or, you know, kind of interpret or mediate the communication uh, that ends up uh, not supporting the understanding of the administrator's responsibility and in uh, communicating clearly what the system of education is like for the child and what opportunities and choices the family can make. Uh, again, the interpreter uh, avoids unnecessary contact prior to the meeting. Now, this thing, this I think is actually interesting, and I'd like your kind of opinion about it. It says, you know, prior to the meeting, the interpreter may initiate contact to ensure understanding of the language and confirm the details uh, to convey any information <clears throat> that could happen uh, by the non-English speaker. Now, the only way that the interpreter would do this would be with the knowledge of the principal or the one who's leading the meeting. And the reason this is important, if there is confusion about the appointment um, or what's going to happen when the family comes and they don't understand and they miss the appointment uh, or they're coming late, you know, this communicates to the educational professional uh, something that's negative about the family, you know, and they'll say really kind of um, disrespectful things like, well, uh, you know, they must not care about their children, that kind of language. If things are miscommunicated and the non-English speaker is not clear about the expectation um, of the meeting. And, and I think this is always, you know, a challenge because we don't want the educational system to maintain stereotypes and biases against families because there's a lack of understanding about the protocols that are necessary in an educational system that tends to be confusing in the first place. Um, again, the interpreter you, you, utilizes the least ob obtrusive mode of interpretation. That, that means you're, you're not in the heart of things, right? The communication is really between the family and the administrator or the, or the teacher, wh whomever it is. And so, you know, your, your role as a professional is to understand your role and not insert yourself into the conversation. Uh, and the reason this is important is you have to protect your own emotional well-being, your own safety and your own privacy. You know, you're a professional and you have needs like everybody else. And so maintaining your role supports the way in which you can continue uh, becoming more and more professional and uh, working in a system to help families better understand and have access to educational opportunities for their children. And so taking care of yourself is one of the key things that you have to be conscious of. Um, and I, I can't really uh, emphasize that enough. You have to take care of yourself first. Besides the fact that you all have other obligations and you have families 
and loved ones who also depend on you. So interpretation is a way to help you better understand separating the role and not taking on uh, what you actually experience in an interpretation session and take it home with you. Because, you know, I've done that many, many times and that's not really, uh, it's not very help, not very helpful and not very healthy. So we're just going to do one more. And then uh, next week, our last session, we'll do the last two. Uh, this goes back to everything that we've already said. It's about accountability. So interpreters are responsible only, right, for the quality of interpretation provided and accountable to all parties in the organization. So your responsibility for the quality of the interpretation. And this means uh, that you maintain your boundaries and do correct interpretation with uh, as little errors as possible. And if there is an error and there seems to be a misunderstanding, then you can just say, you know, um, there's some confusion. Uh, I interpreted this perhaps in a way that wasn't made as clear as could be. So an example here that was given in the meeting previously is this kind of sense of um, humility or knowing your competency and then depending on yourself to learn what you have to learn to become more competent. So the interpreter declines assignments that require knowledge or skills beyond his or her competence. So if there's a situation, and I can see this happening <clears throat> with less skillful interpreters than most, most people um, who have applied for a level one interpretation have been doing interpreting for a very long time. Uh, and they've had to, in IEP meetings, and that's why it came up in the very first meeting, uh, about the, the particular educational language uh, used in IEP, IEPs. One would be something like an administrator or a special ed person talking about, quote unquote, a disability or a delay in learning. And then the parent, you know, not understanding at all and just being uh, very distraught about what is being said. So the skill of an interpreter is to actually uh, understand and see those kind of roadblocks and if you don't have as much familiarity based on the situation and the educational uh, language being used, then you know you know the kind of goals that you have to set to become more knowledgeable. And you don't have to, you know, say yes to every single assignment. And you can say, you know, I would like to brush up more on, you know, the terms that are going to be used during this meeting. Um, and again. The interpreter can say to the people immediately uh, the direction of the encounter if it becomes clear that the expertise needed for the interpretation, you know, is not, uh, you don't feel comfortable with, you know. So the best thing is this whole idea of the responsibility and of being accountable uh, for knowing your own limits. And that's the reason for every module when, you know, I've suggested that you look at all the objectives and you identify, you know, in the objectives under the standards and the ethical principle, things that you want to work on. Everybody has, you know, we're always learning. I'm always learning. I'm always learning things from you and your experiences. I'm always learning things from students uh, that I still teach and work with. Uh, and from district uh, administrators, uh, friends who are teachers. And so if we're all learning together, then the goal is to identify those things that we want to work on. And that shows a really good development in self-assessment and being aware of your own abilities, not in any way saying that you're not good enough or anything like that. I mean, it's just the opposite. It's about identifying your strengths and building on them and identifying those things that you want to get better at, that you want to work on. So that's the reason the modules are set up in that way, to really be honest about your own self-assessment uh, and to develop the kind of goals that you want to pursue uh, in your future as an interpreter. 
uh, again, you know, <clears throat> there are limits. Uh, let's see. Limits and obligations and take step to ascertain that all parties understand them. So, you know, in, in assessing yourself, it's important for you to be honest with yourself as well as um, others with whom you are working. Uh, and again, there are legislative requirements. You already know HB 302, HB 230 for registration is also really important. Um, and that I'll put in kind of at the last, in the last module. Uh, the interpreter maintains transparency. The re I really like this. It's kind of like a, a, a STEM sentence that you can use. You know, when clarification is necessary, you can say, uh, I, the interpreter, need clarification. So if you need clarification, then it means that you, and you're willing to ask for clarification from the administrator or from the family, then you're acknowledging that you want to be totally transparent and that you want your interpretation to be as accurate as, a po as possible. Uh, as well as knowing that the accountability for the educational um uh, the educational explanations are clearly at the administrative level. But if you need that kind of support for clarification, it's good for you know for you yourself to get in the practice of saying, can you clarify this for me so that I can explain it, so that I can interpret more accurately? Um, the interpreter brings to attention an appropriate person, any circumstance or condition that impedes full compliance with any standard in the doc in this document, including but not limited to a conflict. This goes back to this whole issue of transparency and accountability and a conflict of interest. If you feel like you have a conflict of interest in relationship to this issue uh, that you're being asked to interpret, then you have to actually say that, as well as, you know, if it's the end of the day and you're completely exhausted, then, you know, you have to figure out uh, or you're unable and you don't have specialized terminology and knowledge of that, you can decline uh, the assignment under conditions uh, that, you, that you say. You know, you're the one who's in control of your own abilities to interpret accurately. And so the idea of you being the person <clears throat> to make it clear about where you stand in relationship to your ability to translate, to interpret, you know, is a really important piece. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing and then uh, next week we'll do standard uh, seven and eight. Okay, so that was a lot, uh, but I, but you can see that it's kind of like, um, <clears throat> the standards are kind of cyclical. They kind of, deepen your understanding of what it means to interpret with fidelity. Uh, they deepen and they go back to accountability, who's accountable. Uh, they define what the role is, uh, how conflict of interest could be a difficulty, that you're not an advocate, right? Uh, you can ask for clarification uh, and set up norms from the beginning of the meeting. So, uh, the standards are, the intention of the standards is to help you really better understand the profession of being a professional interpreter so that you grow in your skills. And, uh, you know, the benefit is uh, all the children in Utah will benefit from the skills that you're developing and their families as well. Um, and that's why we're here. I mean, that's our purpose. So what other comments or questions or quests or um, <clears throat> experiences do you want to share with us? We have about 10 more minutes. Well, I hope these conversations have been helpful. I just want to thank each of you for being present uh, and for your commitment to the children of Utah 
uh, and their families and how important the work of being an interpreter and becoming a skillful professional, how important that work is and what a privilege it is to uh, actually be a part of your learning. So thank you so much and I'll see you next week for our last session.